and welcome to the Indian Ocean World podcast. My name is Sam Gleaverim, and I am the producer of this show. I am very pleased to be presenting what I hope will remain a tradition here at the podcast, the second annual research roundup. Instead of our usual long-form interview, we want to highlight today the work of five of our RAs by putting them in conversation with Dr. Philip Gooding, one of the project managers here at the Indian Ocean World Center and the podcast's usual host. As you'll hear, we have a wonderful team of undergraduate and graduate RAs collaborating on a large shared environmental history project under the direction of Dr. Gooding, whom you may hear called by his nickname Nod, and of course, the direction of Professor Gwynne Campbell, founding director here at the IWC. Thanks so much for your listenership over the past year. We can't wait for you to hear the great interviews that we have lined up for the next season. I'm now thrilled to be joined by uh, Nadia Fekir. Now, avid listeners to our podcast will know that Nadia was one of our podcasts for the previous academic year as well. Um, so it's a thrill to be able to welcome her back. It, rec- it represents a long-term uh, and fruitful collaboration. Um, Nadia, thanks very much for joining us for um, what's turning into an annual podcast. For those of us who uh, have only come to our podcast recently, and we know that there are many of them, do you just give, give us a kind of refresher? What brought you to the IWC? And uh, yeah, what's your kind of broader kind of academic interest? Thanks. Yeah, I'm really glad to be back this year again. Um, So I've been working at the IOWC for about a year and a half now, and I discovered the center kind of accidentally. I was invited to a History Students Association brunch event, and it was actually you had given a talk there. And I was really interested about your topic, sort of how you were taking more qualitative um, historical data and standardizing it and indexing it to talk about floods. Um, and I was kind of blown away by that. Um, so I shot, like, shot you an email and I was like, is there anything I could do at the center? And it worked out and a year and a half, I'm still here. Um, so yeah, I'm going into my final year next year of environmental studies here at McGill. And I have a concentration in um, health related, anything related to health. Um, so I'm, Needless to say, I'm more interested in the human aspect of the environment and of climate change. And so kind of being able to work on these projects here at the IOWC has been feeding that curiosity of mine um, as well. I am quite interested in history, so it's been a perfect blend of all my interests. You kind of alluded to it there then. So what have you been working on uh, in the last year or so? Great. So I've had two main projects, which are both kind of sub projects of other bigger things going on at the center um and they both have to do with volcanoes and sort of the uh climactic af- aftermaths of those so the first project um had to do with the Krakatoa eruption in later in the 19th century and my area of research was East Africa and we used uh, missionary sources letters that missionaries had been writing to each other to sort of gauge what the climactic conditions were and what was going on on the ground in terms of like how were specifically native um, communities kind of dealing with the um, aftermath of the volcano. Um, It was a lot of accounts of drought um, and stuff, which I kind of extracted all those um, extracts, I guess, of the letters and sort of tried to standardize them um, as much as I can into different themes. Um, And so that project, um, I kind of got to the end of those papers after a few months. And then next, I did sort of the same sort of methodology with um, some government gazette papers from Malaysia, uh, specifically the Penang province in Malaysia. And that was kind of the same time frame as the Tambora eruption, which happened in the spring of 1816. And so once again, it was just to kind of identify any mentions of weather and any sort of social or like political consequences of that weather. Um, And yeah, I finally finished up going through those papers recently. And now I'm just in the standardizing and analysis portion of the project. Wonderful. So it's fairly diverse. We've got the end and the beginning of the 19th century. You've got 
two different corners uh, or two different sides of the uh, Indian Ocean. Um, I suppose, what have been the challenges and opportunities you've gone through, kind of almost in a comparative sense between those kind of sources? Yeah, so for the East Africa uh, missionary letters, I would say the first challenge was just how hard they were to read. They were the original or scans of the original letters. They hadn't been transcribed or anything. Um, and so I think the biggest learning curve was just getting used to the handwriting. And because it was so many different uh, writers in these papers, um, there was a lot of different handwritings to get used to, and some were much better than others. Also, generally on that note, um, the quality of the scan was not always great either. So I would say those were the two hardest parts. But in terms of learning, I guess on the flip side of that is that I became very quick and like much better at sort of scanning um, stuff quicker and like identifying or being able to read um, 19th century cursive, which is proving to be increasingly useful <laughs> um, during my time here. So I would say that's the biggest challenge for the East Africa ones. And then for the Penang papers, which were typed, and I actually got to learn how to use a micro fish uh, machine to scan all of the slides, which was really cool. Um, but with that one, I would say that the biggest problem is one of like geographic scale, as in these papers were really not intended to report on um, stuff going on at Prince of Wales, the settlement. Rather, it was meant to kind of exchange intelligence between colonies. So it was a lot, there was a lot of reports on what was going on in Europe with the Napoleonic Wars and um, a lot of stuff uh, with wars in India and Southeast Asia. So much of the qualitative I guess data, it wasn't concentrated on the right area. So we're trying to find other sources to kind of supplement that. But what the papers did have, and I guess the most fruitful thing to come out of these was they had pretty detailed um, temperature and rain and weather reports that were being that we're using and we're luckily able to kind of standardize that and try to draw some conclusions from there. I really look forward to seeing uh, how those standardizations come together. Obviously, we've worked quite a lot on standardizing climate data together in the past. Um, listeners should look forward to a co-authored piece, which is shortly to come out with the Journal of Southern African Studies, uh, which is a climate history of the first decade of Dutch settlement at the Cape Colony, which stems from um, Nadia's um, excellent work, which he detailed in last year's podcast on the kind of the research roundup at the IWC. Hopefully, um, your work on Eastern Africa following Fakata, on Penang following uh, Tambora, will um, result in similar successes moving forwards. Nadia, thank you so much for joining us and for your ongoing work with the IWC. It's always great working with you. Thanks so much. Lilia Scudamore, thank you very much for coming to talk to us about your research at the IWC. Again, avid listeners will know you've been here for more than a year and you were part of this podcast uh, this time last year. But for our new listeners, can you just tell us uh, how you came to the IWC uh, and also what your broader interests are um, in terms of where you are in your academic career, um, what um, involved you with kind of history as kind of one of your major interests. Yeah, absolutely. So I came to the IOWC in February of 2023. So I've been here for about a year and a half now. Um, and I've loved my time here. I've worked on a couple of different projects. But what really interested me in the IOWC was environmental history. That was a type of history I really hadn't been engaged in before um, and really fascinated me. Um, and particularly since then, I've been interested in different histories of disease. Um, I'll be starting my master's next year in, in that area, focused more on tuberculosis in the US in the early 20th century, so a little bit different than with the IOWC, but um, that definitely inspired me um, a lot about it. Wonderful. And it's been uh, great to have you here during your I suppose, final year of your undergraduate. Many congratulations on graduating and uh, yeah, fantastic news that you're continuing your studies. Um, so in terms of what you've been doing in the last year, what have you been doing at the IWC? So for about the last year, um, I spent a little bit of time wrapping up what I spoke about last time um, in this episode last year of missionary data about China and East Africa. 
Um, but since then, I've switched to focusing on primarily Southeast Asia and looking at the paper The Straits Times, particularly in the years between 1883 to 1885. Um, this project started of looking for different environmental and clim climatical effects of the eruption of Krakatau. Um, but since then, the project has shifted focus a little bit um, to looking at a drought between the years of 1882 through 1885 that we found by looking at qualitative and quantitative data that was published in the Straits Times during this time. And now that's expanded to looking at government gazettes out of Singapore, um, as well as comparing it a little bit to some other English language newspapers in Southeast Asia at the time. It's been wonderful to see this project um, develop as well from something that was quite narrowly focused on the effects of, volcan of a volcanic eruption, looking in uh, a particular newspaper to something that is multi-source based now. And of course, you um, presented um, this research wonderfully as well at the recent um, Canadian Historical Association conference um, in our panel on volcanic eruptions, um, climate and society in the Indian Ocean world. I just want to ask you, though, um, what have you enjoyed or what have you found most interesting or even most challenging about like the research process? Obviously, you had kind of a very narrow research question, a very narrow source base to begin with. How did that develop into something that was much bigger and how have you kind of found that experience? Yeah, first with what's been really enjoyable about it, looking at the Straits Times during this time, the population is quite small um, in the Straits settlements, which means they're quite gossipy as well. There are certain columns that are just gossip columns, so that's enjoyable. But how they're talking about Krakatau, what I found is um, these colonists really saw themselves in this broader global, particularly British imperial view. Um, but because of that, they're getting reports from all over the world. There were steamships beginning right when the paper started to be published in 1845 that were sailing regularly, which means that um, there's just news from Canada, from the UK, from India, from Australia coming in and, and how they're talking about it. So the data collection itself from the Straits Times has, has come much more easily than some other projects I've worked on. But what's been challenging is, is going through that and finding how much of that is truly accurate. Again, these are European colonists. Many of them arrived recently. Um, so their relationship with their environment and how they're reporting it is oftentimes inaccurate to, to what um, may actually be going on. And it's also skewed then really in research of trying to find the societal effects of things such as drought for how this is impacting people beyond these small communities. And so um, we've started looking into things such as the reservoirs that were built and them turning on and off water and who is actually having access to those taps um, and trying to study what these droughts actually looked like and why they may or may not have been impactful. And uh, I suppose the Straits Times was quite limited in reporting on some of those facets. Where did you get the kind of the information on uh, on those kinds of happenings, particularly for um, local populations uh, and indented populations in Singapore? Yeah, um, it's been a variety of things. One, the government gazettes particularly do talk about it a little bit. These are populations they're they're trying to colonize and use, and particularly for labor in these colonies. So looking at that is where they discuss it. And then there's also some scholars such as Fiona Williamson who have done an excellent job so far reconstructing um, these types of ideas and doing research in these areas so far. Well, this has been a it's great chatting to you about this project. It's a really wonderful one. It's been great seeing it come together. It's been written up right now. In fact, I know that Lily has been working on it even this morning before this recording. Um, it looks fantastic. Um, and I look forward to, and I hope we all look forward to uh, that being shared with the world in written form in the near future as well. Lily, thank you very much for this. Uh, it's great working with you as always. Sienna Xu, thank you very much for joining us. Firstly, I want to ask you, um, how did you come to the IWC and what is your academic background? So I am a computer science student. I came to IWC because I saw this job posting that was asking for someone who could do more quantitative side of data collection and analysis. And that was basically what I did. So I applied and I got accepted and I've been working on a lot of data collection, analysis, specialization, etc. at the research center. Wonderful. And it's been wonderful to have you part of that process as well. Um, so I know you've worked on a number of things while you've been here. You've solved so many problems and so many challenges that um, historians who aren't trained in computer science in any way whatsoever, um, who 
just have no comprehension of how to basically compute. But I know one project in particular worked significantly more on than others. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit a bit more about that. Yeah, so Nod is working on a book that is about the impacts of the 1883 eruption of Pocatoa. And I've been helping with the China chapter because I also speak Mandarin. And there are two aspects in this work that I'm doing. The first one is, of course, the quantitative data collection and analysis part. And the second one is I look into the Chinese historical documents uh, collected in this book called The Compendium of Chinese Meteorological Records of the Last 3,000 Years. So I've been looking at that as well. Sure. So what? So when you're doing the um, data analysis, what kind of data were you looking at? Is a lot of different kinds of data. So of course we use, say, rain gauges around the world. So we use rain gauges from this database called GHCN. And we also use simulation data because that is kind of what is hot right now. Like we use this database called FIDA and also this one called LMR. And together we collected a lot of simulation data from there. And then the other interesting one is because a lot of data, uh, real data, real collected data like rain gauges, they are kind of in more populated area. So like in Western China is, we don't have as much data, but there we got this database that measured the tree ring, like the tree growth uh, for the last 2,000, 3,000 years. And we were able to look to the growth index to see maybe a tree grew, uh, like a network of tree grew more slowly that year. So like, Maybe the temperature was lower, the rain was, the rainfall was also lower, etc. That was a significant effort. I know with so many lines of data, and you visualize them so beautifully. Um, and hopefully, we'll be sharing those with uh, every, those visualizations with uh, um, colleagues in the near future. Um, also, the compendium. Um, can you just tell us some more about the, what's in the compendium um, and how you worked with it too? Yeah. So the compendium is a collection of a lot of different governmental gazettes and chrono- chronologies around China for the last 3,000 years. And we mainly look at the, you know, the 1880s and throughout China. And it, it was categorized by location. So you can look at each year and at each location and there will be some qualitative accounts of say droughts or like famine or rainfall, those kind of things. And I collected them and I labeled them and geolocated them so we could work on mapping and visualizations later on. Yeah, and what's come out of those, again, some fantastic visualizations. And again, we really look forward to sharing those with you. Um, Sienna, your work with us is absolutely invaluable. Um, I hope you've enjoyed working with us as much as we've enjoyed working with you. Uh, And we uh, look forward to working with you uh, moving forward as well. Thank you. Sam Glee Riemann, thank you very much for agreeing to do this as well. And of course, you're very familiar with podcasts as you um, produce the podcast um, and sometimes even step in as host as well, um, and very, very ably at that. Um, in addition to that, you do um, all sorts of things in terms of organizing the speaker series and just organizing a lot of our activities at the IWC. For this session, though, obviously, it's a research roundup. Let's mm-hmm. talk about your research. Firstly, what brought you to the IWC in terms of interests? Okay. Yeah. And secondly, um, what have you been working on? My first project when I came to the IWC, I started here about two years ago, and it was to help with the podcast and with some of these research events that we hold, including the speaker series, importantly. So that was actually why I was hired on. I had a little bit of audio production experience, and that's what it was. My, my academic background is very... Uh, eclectic and the my most recent degree is a master's degree in ancient greek poetry so this is a, a big change for me but about a year ago i had a little more extra time in my schedule and i was very happy to join on and do some more research as well on the environmental history side which is the big project going on at the center right now so i have also been looking at uh, volcanic eruptions you were very kind to give me some free reign and you said here's the 1815 tambora eruption see what's going on in the Indian ocean world what is there and i thought for a while it was going to be a mauritius project and looking trying to see what was going on in mauritius turns out there isn't good climatological data from that period but what i did end up finding is that there's really good data associated with 
English East India Company ships that are sailing through that area, and a lot of those have already been indexed as numeric data uh, by climatologists. We can recognize since the 1980s that this is a valuable source, and so I got myself stuck in with a database called iCodes or iCoeds. I don't, never heard it pronounced out loud. Um, and iCodes is a project of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the, the U.S. It's been going since the early 1980s compiling shipborne logs from around the world from a number of different uh, data gathering projects. And we have found some really interesting stuff in terms of rainfall, cloud cover, climate change in the Southwest Indian Ocean uh, around both the 1815 Tambora eruption and the earlier 1808-1809 mystery eruption. And yes, your research here has been really interesting. And um, like Lilia um, and like Hannah, who we're going to talk to in a minute, um, you ably and wonderfully presented this research at um, the Canadian Historical Association annual meeting. How big is the data set you're look- working with? How, how much have you had to comb through? Kind of give a sense of scale here. Um, what are kind of your parameters from, from uh, a temporal standpoint? Mm-hmm. How did you establish that, that you had some kind of interesting things going on in 1808? to 1815. So yeah, so uh, I have the luxury again of having this numeric data already kind of compiled and and available for me. So I set some arbitrary geographic boundaries um, between the equator and 50 degrees south in longitude and between 17 and 37-ish It's roughly between the Cape and the Maldives. Yeah, between the Cape and the Maldives in terms of... of, So what I wanted to do is include the... uh, Mauritian island of Rodrigues um, and Cape Town. So I wanted to have those both as points. Within that, we have managed to, to break it down into some subregions to kind of analyze this a little bit. But that overall area, uh, when I took 1795 to 1835, so 20 years before and after the Tambora eruption, uh, that was 56 odd thousand lines of data, um, it, none of which are complete. Some ships were carrying barometers, some ships were carrying thermometers, some ships had really good um, qualitative uh, records of, of wind speed or other weather events. Uh, some ships didn't, right? No no ship is going to be able to do all those things accurately or, or evenly. But we managed to get some some very interesting results out of the data that we had, especially once we broke it down into smaller geographic areas. Yeah, it really is. It's really interesting stuff. And we're hopefully going to turn this into a publication uh, yeah. in uh, fairly short order. So following on from that, um, how did you go about standardizing this data? There's 56,000 rows. Mm-hmm. You're not going to read every single one. And you mentioned that there were barometers, thermometers. One thing you didn't mention that, that, there weren't, that you didn't mention rain gauges. And that's because there weren't any rain gauges. No. But one of the things you mentioned that you that you found as interesting were rainfall records. Yeah, absolutely. So how yeah. are you going through 56,000 lines of data to establish rainfall patterns? So uh, almost all, not all, but almost all of these ship's logs and the, the data collection projects have, have recorded this as well. They have, uh, or what the weather is going on, observable from the ship. We set up a system for each day between January 1st of 1795 and January 1st of 1836. Uh each day has a value we, we've managed to standardize uh, for how rainy it was between uh, zero and one. And then that gives us a numeric value of uh, that we can play with. And we can uh, map that across time and across geography, and we can see where rainfall patterns shift. And that's really interesting. And, and that's kind of what I want to explore going forward as we're trying to move this towards publication is it looks like rainfall is the big thing that does change. That we don't see in any of the modeling data, or it's not accurately reflected in the modeling data. They expect certain uh, anomalies, but they don't can't identify exactly what those anomalies are. And then I also want to see what rain means for you know people actually that are on these ships, right? These, these climatologists have taken the data that they were interested in, the instrumental data and the weather observations, but there's other data in the ship's logs. And so I want to go back to those primary documents and look at it more as like a, you know, this project is turning me into a, Nelsonian agent sale maritime historian and uh, and that's what I want to go look at right I want to go look at what these sailors are actually doing and see if there there's anything that we can glean from these these logs that the climatologists overlooked it's a fantastic project and yeah I this looks has a lot of legs 
Um, as I said, it's wonderfully presented at the Canadian Historical Association annual meeting. Um, and yes, we hope to see that it will come to publication soon. We should also mention here from both of us some, one, some thanks to someone we've heard from already in this podcast, uh, Sienna Su, yeah, um, who did some, who did a lot of the data pulling originally, yeah. which is in formats that neither of us understood, yeah. putting into a format that we could understand, so, so that 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 uh, you could do the analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, um, yeah, it's fantastic stuff, and it's been great working with you. I uh, look forward to working with you more moving forwards. Absolutely, thanks so much. All right, so Hannah Spawasa Soroka, thank you very much for joining us for this um, podcast recording. It's been wonderful working with you since you've been here. Um, firstly, um, what's your academic background um, and how did you come to the IWC? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, my academic background is actually very not Indian Ocean world. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of History and Classical Studies here at McGill, and I am trained as an early modern Europeanist. And the way I came to work with the IOWC is that uh, the project I'm working on requires working knowledge of Dutch and requires some context for the 17th century. And so I was a good fit for the project, uh, I think, I hope. I uh, absolutely, you're the perfect candidate for the project and you have justified that uh, since you've been here. Um, it's been wonderful working with you. Um, so perhaps then you can tell us more about that project. Uh, what have you been doing? What have you been doing um, at the IWC? So the the portion of the project that I've been working on concerns the 17th century volcanic cluster uh, in Dutch Batavia and the Dutch East Indies. Um, and I've been looking through the Dutch daily registers centered on the port of Batavia, trying to find evidence of volcanic eruptions and their climatic impacts. Fantastic. And you um, presented this um, research wonderfully at the uh, recent uh, Canadian Historical Association um, annual meeting. Um, can you just kind of give a kind of a sense of what have you found in these uh, the day registers? Uh, what, what, what comprises the day register and do they comment very much on, on climate and its effects on society? So the daily registers are really interesting. The, the documents I've been working with are... Uh, transcribed editions of handwritten documents, many of which have been lost, and this has been a substantial hurdle for my research. And what the daily registers do is basically it's a record of everything that's going on on the day. So all the ships coming in and leaving port, uh, any important letters that have arrived. But importantly, unlike other registers that uh, part you know uh, people on the project have looked at, the daily registers in Batavia are not recording the weather on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they'll record extreme weather, uh, they'll record weather that has an impact on Dutch East India Company workers or on the products, the colonial commodities they're shipping all over the place, uh, but as a rule they're not telling you what the weather's like most days. So given the remit within the project, which is to analyse um, how a series of volcanic eruptions in the mid-17th century may have impacted climate and society in the uh, in and around what uh, what is now Jakarta, um, what have you looked at instead when when there is so, when weather data is so lacking? So, because the Dutch uh, East India Company is so focused on colonial commodity, I looked at some of those commodities. Most importantly, the rice crop, which is incredibly dependent on weather. It requires steady rain uh, to cover most of the paddy and keep the crop mostly submerged during its growing season. Uh, this uh, means that if the crop is doing well, you have evidence of regular steady rain. Uh, if the crop is drying out, you have evidence that there is no rain. And what I found is that actually in the years 1640 to 1641, which is where I have the most complete record, uh, the crop actually did extremely well, uh, so well that uh, rice prices went down in the region in general. That was an interesting finding. And of course, um, you're going to continue researching uh, beyond these years as well. What do you plan to do uh, moving forward with this project? So what I need to do is, is start looking at the years beyond 1640 to 41, where we have uh, less complete registers. Uh, in 1640 to 42, there is just a really gifted, uh, gifted administrator in charge of the records. So those are kind of the crown jewel of the daily registers. And that's where I've begun. 
Uh, but of course, there are other registers that we can look at. There are other uh, colonial actors in the region. So obviously the Portuguese, but also the English, the Danish, all have uh, crews sailing around present day Indonesia. And so it might be worthwhile to look at them and to think about how they're experiencing climate and weather uh, and the commodity trade, uh, which is always, an, at least I think, is a nice proxy. Um, so those are some kind of obvious next steps. Uh, another avenue I know that you and I have discussed is tree ring data, which will hopefully tell us a lot more about the rain patterns. Yeah, really, your presentation at CHA earlier this month was um, really excellent. It's really great to hear um, the research you've been doing there. I'm really excited about the way this project's moving forward, and it's been great working with you. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so project. much. It's been a real pleasure to work on the project. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The Indian Ocean World podcast is produced under the Shirk funded partnership of Praising Risk Past and Present. The podcast runs in conjunction with the annual speaker series at the Indian Ocean World Centre at McGill University, Montreal. 